So eight years ago, I started uh, working for Medicine Sons Frontier in, uh, and I was placed in Nigeria. Um, I was super excited to go out for the first time to feel like I was doing good firsthand as a nurse in a very remote clinic in uh, Zamfara State, which is near the border of Niger. Um, the project was for children under five and there was a great need there because at the time there had been an environmental impact which had resulted in lead poisoning causing thousands of children to die and a lot more to be developmentally challenged. And on top of that, there was the usual uh, malaria, um, massive problems, um, and also outbreaks of cholera and annual outbreaks of meningitis. So there was a huge burden um, of poor health and mortality in the area. So I turned up to manage the local hospital and the outreach clinic there and um, was expecting people to be um, as excited as me to receive the treatment, but it was actually quite difficult to bring people to come to the clinics um, to receive all that treatment. They were a bit suspicious about, even though it was world-class medicine that had been specially produced for this lead poisoning, they were quite suspicious of that, and also obviously suspicious of us coming in from the outside to this very rural community. And this came to the forefront of my mind when I was sent to go to an outreach um, clinic where we were looking to see if we could expand the scope of the project. And they, we went to see the local health centre, which as you can imagine was very resource poor, um, not providing a, a quality of service at all to that community. But when we were there on that day, there was also a traditional medicine man who was traveling through the village and people were queuing up to uh, go and pay quite a large proportion of their income to get these herbal teas, which they believed would cure them rather than the medicines that we would be able to give them for free that was evidenced and effective. So this really struck me um, really in, in the face about how um, it was so important for not just me to know the evidence and to know the effectiveness of the medical care, but about that community and how we can empower them to ask for that treatment themselves and to get the medical care that they deserve. So fast forward a few years, I now work for the Schistomyces Control Initiative um, and I'm a senior programme advisor, mostly working in Ethiopia and Tanzania. Um, SCI have just gone through um, a strategy change, so we've got our new strategy out um, this year. And now we're really focusing on that exact point, is how do we empower local communities? So not just delivering our signature uh, cost-effective treatment programme, but also articulating more about how we do that and how we're able to empower not just the national governments to have ownership of their projects, but also those local communities. So today I'm going to just talk a bit about our strategy and uh, also we've got some challenges so we'd all as always love from the EA community some feedback and input to make our projects as good as possible. So for those who are not familiar with SCI, um, we work in 15 sub-Saharan African countries and we're delivering treatments for parasitic worm infections, um, mostly focusing on schistosomiasis and soil transmitted helminths, or for short, schisto and STH. And um, we deliver those programmes through the national governments. So we don't directly implement, we support the national governments to deliver their own programmes through their existing health systems. Um, so yeah, we're really trying in this new strategy to articulate better our approach. So how we do things, not just what we're able to achieve at the end of those treatments. So one of our um, big things we want to emphasise, what we've been doing for a long time, but just wanting to emphasise, that's what we do, is our partnerships. So looking at the uh, partnerships and collaborations with other sectors like water, sanitation and hygiene, and also um, other sectors like education and nutrition, which are overlapping as well. But also we really want to show that um, it's how we're working through the partnerships with the local governments that makes it as effective um, as we can be. 
Um, we're also looking at our own processes and procedures, making them as effective internally, but also making it uh, accessible for the countries and governments which we work, so they can have their own embedded knowledge management systems, and they can mirror some of the approaches that we might use as standard in our procedures, but they might not have had the awareness of or education to use. So we're really keen to put some innovation into the country programmes. But we're also trying to keep that sustainability element. Schistosomiasis in particular is not going to go away very quickly. We're going to have to work for many years at delivering the mass drug administration programmes. And then after that, there still needs to be that health system in place that can sustain the surveillance so that those, these diseases don't just come back again. It's not good enough just to treat until they go down enough because they'll just come back without uh, the proper water sanitation, education, behaviour change. So we need to make sure the health systems are strong and robust to be able to sustain the programmes now, but also surveillance in the future. And as always, we are evidence-based, but now we're not just saying that we're evidencing about the treatments for the parasitic worm infections. We also want to evidence the approach that we use to prove that it is a very effective way and also just understand more about how we're connecting and the real power of going through existing health systems and also strengthening them from the inside. And we want to understand and be able to articulate that better. So just going to an example uh, of how Ethiopia works, just to give a bit more uh, detail around that. Um, as I say, I mostly work in Ethiopia. Um, so what happens at the beginning of the year is the WHO, uh, through a drug donation programme, can deliver the drugs so that the country teams are able to distribute them all over the country. Um, so we also get um, funding for the programme from a variety of sources. Uh, so SCI is just one of those sources for the government. Um, so this year in total, they've had hundreds of uh, millions of tablets. And it, even just the Shisto and STH programmes are over six million uh, dollars, US dollars this year. So what we do at SCI is support the national level governments. So um, and thinking about the, the size of that programme, there's only one person in the Ministry of Health that's responsible for the Shisto and STH programme. So you can imagine the capacity that he has to be able to try and initiate, sustain, maintain this level of programme. It's a lot. And also he's been assigned to that position rather than selected because of his knowledge on NTDs. So we are there to really support, mentor and coach in all the areas of the programme, which is leadership, where we're talking about advocacy and how to mobilise the staff at lower levels. We're uh, training them, thinking about how they can train others, like a train the trainer approach. We're doing drug distribution and procurement, so making sure they have a good process of inventory that means the drugs get safely on time in day well stored to those people who need them and also about how to mobilize the community to make sure they come and are aware of that drug distribution on that particular day and lastly the monitoring and evaluation so we're really making sure that they understand the impact of the processes and of delivering those drugs. And then, then that relies on a cascade. So in Ethiopia, that one person at national level will train the nine regional NTD coordinators. That's neglected tropical disease coordinators. They do all the neglected tropical diseases. So we have eight endemic in Ethiopia. Plus, they'll have to do malaria programs and TB programs. So you can imagine it's a huge volume of work they have to do. So we need to make sure that the packages are very easily accessible and understandable so they can understand, pick it up and deliver a very good programme that's safe. They will then train the district level coordinators. So we are working in fi over 550 districts in Ethiopia, and they will then train the health extension workers. So this year we're doing over 22,000 health extension worker training, as well as the teachers in the school get training for awareness so they can support the health extension workers. 
That's all to deliver over 8 million treatments for schistosomiasis this year and 15 million for soil transmitted ailments. And then we need to make sure that they can monitor and evaluate, but actually the impact of them being able to do that monitoring and evaluation is more about the accountability. So they understand that they can go to the funders and report back to them, in including us at SCI, to show what um, they have managed to achieve and also really take charge and ownership of that programme because they feel that buy-in from when they see that the impact has actually improved. So we use this programme cycle to um, help ensure there's ownership and accountability. So of course our ultimate aim is to have disease elimination of parasitic worm infections but it's not as simple as just sticking to the WHO coverage target of 75% for school-aged children. It's actually we need to go above and beyond. So we're looking now at how we can reach those hard to reach children, the ones that don't go to school that will receive the medicine at the school-based platform. We want to make sure that the children who are in refugee camps, who are nomadic, who maybe have to work from a very young age and are out doing the agricultural field work, are still able to get those tablets every day, every year when they are at deworming day. But be, as well as alongside the disease elimination, we really want to make sure that there's strong health systems along the way. So we don't want to interrupt the health system by taking over or interjecting. We want to make sure that all the teams are learning alongside us through the whole journey to make sure there's that institutional learning that will never go away from these national health systems. And we need to make sure that they're robust and resilient. These countries often face so many disasters. For example, Liberia had to stop their program at some time for Ebola and we managed to quickly engage them again. But we want to make sure that if there's flooding, national disasters or other disease epidemics, that countries from now on can continue their deworming programs. And to be able to make sure that it's not just always a standalone externally funded programme, we need to make sure that we can contain them to a size that's more manageable and economically viable so that the programmes can then transition into the mainstream health system. And that's more likely to be when we reach um, a, a smaller proportion of treatments uh, annually and also definitely when we get into the surveillance stage because the health system will need to maintain that surveillance level on their own. So this leads us to some of the challenges, is that um, we're really hoping that the governments will be able to think about their investment into NTD programmes in general, but specifically uh, schistosomiasis and soil transmitted ailments. We want to make sure that there's the political will to engage with these programmes, that people understand what the complexity of the um, health burden is on these young people and the impact that it can have from very simple measures. So we want to create the political will, but also we want to make sure that that not only comes from us externally, but also from the community themselves. We want to make sure that that community will be able to have a community, like create a demand on their own. If we think about what happens if something from, um, for example, if a train is late in the UK, people would be on Twitter, they'd be demanding a refund, and that is what then would happen, is you create that demand yourself. But in communities that we work, they don't even have any expectation of a health service, let alone a quality health service. So that's what we want to make sure that the community know what is quality and what they should be deserving. And then we want to make sure that the health systems have that capacity, not only to deliver the deworming programme now, but it will change over the years. It maybe will need reassessments, we'll need to evaluate the data. We need to make sure that we have work alongside existing other NTDs, but also in terms of the water and sanitation sectors. So we need the teams to have capacity to be able to do that. 
So now our challenge is how do we transition from being a very cost effective uh, organisation who's horizontally scaled to deliver huge amounts of treatments with quite a small team but having a big impact to how we actually now in, um, embed ourselves vertically into the health system by making sure we get all those hard to reach children and eliminate the disease, by making sure that the health system is strong enough by making sure that we build that capacity. So that is now our challenge, is to think about how we can effectively measure and also articulate what the value add is of our approaches and processes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Questions. I think everybody knows the drill through the Bizabo app and on the mobile website, london.eaglobal.org slash polls. It's probably the 75th time I've said that. <laughs> um, I would love to start off with a question just around this disease itself, which is a mouthful, schistosomiasis. Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, so what is it? I mean, what happens? Um, yeah, so in the, it's a parasitic worm, so when the children have that disease, um, it can be either in the uh, bowel or the bladder, so there's two different types, but they're both treated with the same medicine. And the way that that's transmitted, we call it like a, a life cycle of, of that particular worm. So for example, um, it's found in a freshwater lake. So if a child or any person would go into the lake, there might be some snails in there in the lake and they produce what we call cicari. The little cicari can then go inside the skin. It's so small, it can just slip inside of the skin and then it will go through the system and into either the bowel or the bladder. And then it will make um, the burden of disease is seen mostly in, in school-aged children because obviously they're smaller, so they feel the effects. And it can produce um, a variety of different conditions. Some of them you might not see initially. So that's one of our challenges is that when people... Um, um, don't know that they're ill or don't immediately see the consequence of that disease, they're not thinking, I want to go and take medicine for that. So some of these diseases can actually, or, or the impact of the disease can actually lie dormant for quite some time um, and you might not feel the full effect of that. And the way it goes back into the lake is through um, open defecation or through um, when it is passed from either the, the urine or the stool back into the lake, then the snail is like the, we call it an intermittent host, then it produces the cicari, the cicari go back into the skin. So things like access to water, um, this is what makes schistosomiasis so different from other parasitic worms, is it's not as easy as saying, you know, get some uh, toilets, for example, because if the cicari is all in the water and you've got nowhere else to wash, for example, yourself or your clothes, or maybe your livelihood is like fishing, then you're always going Going to be contaminated by that water. So it's quite a challenging problem in terms of the causality, but also the burden of disease, which is not seen immediately, which won't cause people initially to go and get access to medical treatment. So ultimately, neither medicine nor sanitation alone can really solve. It, yeah, so we sort of think about it as like a, I guess, a three-legged stool, is that we, there's a part about the vector, so the snail, thinking about the vec intermittent host control. So is there anything we can do in terms of the lakes and understanding the, the snail is that vector? And then there's also the part, yeah, as you say, about the water and sanitation, but not simply having, um, you know, the toilet or just a little bit of water. It would have to be on such a scale that people wouldn't need to have the contact with the water or they would be able, for example, if they're fishermen, to um, be able to protect themselves against that risk and understand the risk so much they can wear, like, the boots to protect themselves from the water. As you say, with the Mass Drug Administration, it's the most cost-effective way for the control as a public health problem, control, but when we're moving to think about elimination of that disease, yes, you're right, you have to think about everything together. So I was reading a little bit, just as you were talking also on Wikipedia, this mm -hmm. affects 250 million people annually. Yeah. 
And, and it, they're all in the poorest countries. And that is with your organization and, and presumably yeah. others. Yeah, so exactly. So at the moment, we're aiming for the control of the disease. So people are still affected, but they wouldn't have the burden of the disease because every year they'll get treatments through the school. So we are bringing down that burden of disease. But in our new strategy, obviously we know that's not enough just to control. We're now pushing to the elimination. So that's where you have to think that extra mile. How do you not just control? So the WHO recommends 75% coverage of all school age children to control the burden of disease. But when we're thinking about elimination goals, it shoots up to above 90% uh, coverage. So that means we need to be thinking of those hard to reach children and actually we don't really know where they, they're not in a census so we don't know exactly how many we're talking about or where those children are so that's a lot of the research we're doing at the moment. So ha has it indeed been accomplished that 75% coverage is the reality in a lot of the places where you're working? So that's what the WHO and all the evidence proves, um, that the 75% coverage is for the control of the disease. However, when you, like any research or, or any evidence, you could actually say, how do you know it's 75% if maybe you don't have an accurate census to make sure your denominator, uh, the bottom number, is the one that is giving you the correct percentage. So it's like any research, you can find ways that you would argue that point, but definitely the overwhelming um, pool of evidence that's out there shows that there's a, a great impact on people's lives by reaching that 75%. So a couple questions from the audience. Um, about your organization, what does the team look like? Uh, what are you guys doing day to day if we were just to kind of observe your work? What yeah. would we see? And what sort of skills do you feel like are missing from your team that you would love to add to be able to extend your work? Yeah, so that's interesting. So at the moment we have um, four main teams. So um, I'm in the programs team and we're program advisors. So we have two or three countries each that we go out um, regularly. So for example, I sometimes go once a month to Ethiopia for about a week, or um, sometimes you just go for training uh, to help or specific times during when the drugs are getting given out. So day to day, we're either in the office catching up with the rest of the teams or we're out in country, maybe about 30% travel for, for most of us. Um, and then there's the monitoring, evaluation and research team, which is got biostatisticians, social scientists and um, an economic advisor, so value for money officer. Um, and they support the country programmes, mostly through us um, as the programme advisors. And they would help with all the statistical analysis of the um, data that we bring back, particularly about impact reports, coverage validation. But they don't just do it for us, they also, uh, they also travel to country to help us train the in-country teams. So eventually those people can do it themselves. Um, and build that skill. And then we have a finance team to support us and also a communications team to help articulate our work. So all together that is a about, few dozen people? Yeah, so we're about, I think, 25? Wow, I okay. Um, so in terms of more skills that we would like, I think we're at a really interesting point where um, we could scale a lot, and that's evidenced in when GiveWell does our assessment. So we are ranked uh, second by GiveWell as a, the most cost-effective charity, uh, non-profit initiative. So um, yeah, when we're looking at um, the, the roles, I think we could go so many directions, but it's how we, we're at the tipping point that we've got a core team of, of roles and people that we need, but at, at different points we're thinking about definitely more about the social science aspect. So we have got one social scientist, but we could do so much in that field. It also thinking about do we um, either collaborate or have consultancy about wash, um, P wash experts to help us think about that a little more. But mostly I think we're in a really nice position where the community that work on neglected tropical diseases are, are very um, good at collaborating. So often we do get skills just through collaboration um, with either research or different organizations at the moment. Yeah. And if I understood correctly, as an organization, you're kind of 
trying to make a shift from a pretty narrow, well-defined set of programs mm -hmm. that you're supporting to a more almost institution building type of challenge? So I think it's rather than a, a shift, I think it's more like an organic uh, movement that's probably happened from the beginning. And it was something we were always known for that the, the programs uh, advisors, including people before me, had very good relationships with the governments that we work with. So actually, I guess rather than a, a shift, it's more just thinking actually this is what we do and it works really well, so how do we evidence it, how do we articulate it and how do we measure it to really encapsulate what the whole program is. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, unfortunately we are already five minutes over time, so I think that's all we have time for today. But how about a round of applause for Carolyn Henry, <laughs> ridding the world of schistosomiasis. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.